Well, shalom everyone and welcome to our Shabbat Shalom service, our Shabbat night service. It is September the 10th, <laughs> yes, yeah, September the 10th, 2021. And we are just excited about all that the Lord has been doing in our lives. We are in lesson 51, the Haftara of that lesson which was titled Nitzavim. We went over it on our Wednesday night Bible study. And today we have the companion study, both in the uh, Tanakh, the Old Testament, and the New Testament the Brit Hadasha. These are the Hebrew words. Tanakh is the Hebrew word for what we call the Old Testament. So we are just excited about what we've been able to accomplish in this year. This is the beginning of a new year in terms of the Jewish calendar as the Yom Torah or the blowing of the trumpets has taken place and we are moving towards Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And so with that, we are going to um, bring information to you re regarding these things. And we just want you to understand how much of a joy we are having in this journey and how next year, we have even greater plans for our journey through the Torah, the first five books of the Bible in one year. It takes discipline, but this walk with Jehovah our God is a walk where discipline is required. But as believers in Yeshua, as our Messiah, we have no excuse because he gave us the Ruach HaKodesh the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth and to guide us on this journey of life that Yeshua has prepared the way. He says, I go to prepare a way for you. If it wasn't so, I would tell you. So he's prepared a way for us, but it requires discipline, and obedience. And whenever we miss the mark, fall short, that doesn't mean we set out to do wrong. It means that the blood of Yeshua has already said, he said that we repent, turn from that behavior, then he will forgive us and cleanse us and bring us into all righteousness. And so we are just excited about what's going on. The music you hear in the background, I don't own the rights to that music, but we just utilize it to get our hearts and minds ready to participate in this, the set apart day. He said, this day is holy. Holy means to be set apart. So Jehovah our God set apart the Sabbath that we may use it as a reminder to rest in him. Rest from our labors, rest in him. Restore, renew ourselves and go forward and do all that we were created to do. So thank you so much for joining us. We're going to get ready to get started. Let the music play just another little while, and then we're going to get on with our lesson. Now today, uh, as you might notice in the background, I we are in a different, <laughs> I'm in another location. I'm at my sister's house, and therefore, once again, I'm a little bit a strange of the place that I am. And also, if you hear a lot of dogs barking in the background, <laughs> just, we're gonna push right on through it. It will be part of the tape. I don't know how to edit things out yet, 
but we're going to push right through it until whatever animal it is that passes by this house has passed by far enough for them to be quiet. But they don't usually miss. So when something comes by, they let us know. So with that, get your hearts and minds ready to go through this word, this Haftarah of Nitzavim. And we had a fascinating time on Wednesday night going through Deuteronomy chapter 29 through chapter 30, verse 20. We, it is amazing. So if you get an opportunity, go to our YouTube channel, channel and you'll get an opportunity to listen for yourself if you missed it. Ooh, excuse me. Oh. All right, so now we're going to get ready to begin our service and we will begin it with our blessing or the sacrament that Yeshua gave us on the night before his death. He told us that as he shared that meal, he took the bread and there's a tradition among the Jewish people to always bless Jehovah for the bread that they have been given to eat. We don't bless the food, we bless him for giving it to us, giving us the wherewithal and the ability to get it. So we say Baruch Atah at Yehovah Eloheinu Malek Halam HaMotzi Lehen Mi Haaretz. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And then Yeshua passed it around. He told his disciples, take this and eat of it. This bread is a symbol of my body, my body that is broken just for you. Do this always in remembrance of me. And so we eat. And then with that, would be the blessing over the wine. For Yeshua passed the wine. First, he blessed Jehovah, our God, for the provision of everything comes from Jehovah. So, Yeshua blessed Jehovah for the grapes that brought forth the wine. Baruch Atah, Yehovah, Eloheinu Malek, Halom, Borei Pari Hagafain. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. And then he passed it around. He said, drink this. Do this in remembrance of me, for this is symbolic of my blood, my blood that is shed for the remission of your sins and for a new relationship with me. Do this often, always, in remembrance of me. Then he passed it around and they drank. All right. So having done that and fulfilled that part of our service with the sacrament of communion, sacrament meaning set apart thing or sacred thing. So with <coughs> excuse me, the wine always does that. <coughs> Let me turn the music off and we will pray and then begin our lesson on tonight. Jehovah, our God, we just bless you for this opportunity. We thank you for the social medium that you brought uh, and, and, and given to man. And we thank you, Father, for this opportunity 
to study your word, studying to show ourselves approved, not workmen, not ashamed of our hire, but working and rightly dividing the word of truth. We bless you, Jehovah, our God, for all that you do. You're a great God and a loving father. Lord Yeshua, our Messiah, you reconciled us back to the Father. And then, after doing that, you rose. You died in our place and you rose after three days with all power in heaven on earth and in, is in your hands. And then you sent the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit of Jehovah, for you three are one to guide us, to come alongside us, to open our hearts and our minds to receive the truth of your word and then empowering us to be obedient. We thank you and we praise you for all that you do. And it's in your name, Yeshua HaMessiah, we pray. Amen. Okay, so let's get, our, get your Bibles ready. Go into... Isaiah 61, verse 10. Now, Isaiah 61 is a very special, a very special text for those that were part of our ministry in California because Isaiah 61 is, is a text that we were studying. And as we studied that, it really got deep within our spirits. Make sure you mute yourself. It really got deep within our spirits. So Isaiah 61, for a long time, we would read that particular text every, oh, I mean, every couple of weeks, we would just take it out and read because it gave us hope. And it's fascinating because now that we understand a little bit more about this period of time, it is the period of hope. And these consolations are the seventh one is with the one we're going to be dealing with on tonight. These are to bring forth hope and a resolve to stand. As Paul said, having done all you can do, yet stand. And so we're required. We even study in our, in our, in our three lessons. One says, when you go. Another says, when you come. And the third lesson says, Nitzavim, you are standing. So you have to stand. When you go out, stand. When you come home, stand. And then finally, understand why you are standing. You're standing on the word of Jehovah our God. And in that, you are studying that word. You're allowing it to get deep within your spirit so that at the right time you can use it in the manner in which the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, would determine to use it. But you have to work. If you think it's just something you can do once a week, you're missing the whole understanding of what the Ruach HaKodesh has come to do. He's come to reveal all truth. Not what game to bet on, not what game to watch, not how you go get this job or that job. He has come to reveal the understanding of the word so that you can go out and do what Yeshua, our Messiah said, do, which is go into all the world and teach them concerning the good news. And so that's what we're supposed to do. And that's what uh, we would do at our church. I mean, it would be like, it wouldn't be more than two or three weeks that would pass and somebody would say, can we read Isaiah 61? And we would go and read the whole chapter of Isaiah 61. And then what was it for? For consolation, for hope, for understanding that Jehovah had given us a promise and he cannot lie. And so that his word will not return to him void, they must accomplish everything that he said they would do. And so that's our testimony. So we would read Isaiah 61, beginning with verse 1. 
and read the whole chapter. And the whole congregation would get inspired and we would have a wonderful service. And it, it wouldn't be more than two or three weeks before somebody would say, after we read it, because we were always reading a scripture of, for that particular day, but they would want to hear Isaiah 61. So when we establish our ministry physically here in Georgia, I know he put in our heart that on the wall as you enter, put Isaiah 60. And remember the Lord Yeshua said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me for he has anointed me. And so we would read that and just have a great time. And so I, I'm glad that it reminds me as we went through this lesson today, it reminded me that that's special for those that were part of predestined in Christ ministries. So with that, let's begin our lesson, uh, a little prelude to the lesson. And I gotta look to my left because I don't have my notes right in front of me, I gotta look to my left. But anyway, this is the final, this is the final of the seven consolations. And it has to be the most powerful because seven is a powerful number. And so we understand that all six weeks, because why? At the beginning of a period, as we get closer to Yom Kippur, the temple, the first temple and the second temple were destroyed during the same dates. The first one was destroyed. And then after Messiah Yeshua walked this earth in 70 AD, the second one was destroyed. And with that, the hope of the people melted. Their hearts melted because the temple the place that you could see from all over the land. This beautiful edifice was destroyed and the people taken into captivity. Now they did return. Many, many people returned, but that was 1948. So that's a long time from 70 AD to 92. Uh, 1948 AD, a long time. So the exile and the pressures and the heartache for the children of Jehovah were great. And so with that, this final consolation is gonna, once again, most of these consolations are always talking about the promise of the Messiah. It's talking about the promise of the Messiah because Moses said that, look, if you don't do what these words that I am teaching you to do, if you don't do that, then you're going to be dispersed all over the land. But even in that, take heart because Jehovah is going to bring you all back together, never to be separated again. And we know in the book of Revelation, it reminds us that the Messiah Yeshua is going to come back. And But this time, we say come back because the first time he came to make the way. The second time he comes back, he's coming to rule as king. And he's going to rule from Jerusalem. And so the study of this word is so rich that... It's just preparation because people from all over the world are going to come to Jerusalem, to the temple, and worship at the foot of the king of kings. All right, let us look at this in it. The joy and the fervor that the prophet is displaying in this is absolutely wonderful, even using the analogy of a wedding. So he's talking about all these things where Jehovah, to understand Jehovah, our God, in the context of the Jewish people, that was it. 
that there was nothing else. It was a part of every aspect of the life of the children of Jehovah. And so it's different. In, in the Gentile church, we, 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 we say it, but we kind of play with it. We don't consider it in the same manner that the people at the time of Moses did, nor that the Orthodox uh, Jewish people of today. It is completely different. And so we wanna acknowledge that as we go through this, but put yourself in that place that we read in Revelations, where you're sure our Messiah will rule with an iron hand and all of us will come back with him and rule with him on this earth. Then it's going to be destroyed in a new heaven and a new earth will come and we'll be given glorified bodies to walk on this earth, never to experience death again because the light of Messiah will be in us. All right, so now let us get into Isaiah 61, verse 10. I, I, if I read the other part, I'd get too emotional. So I'm going to start at 10, which is when the Haftarah, the companion study, that's what Haftarah means, companion study, begins. It says, I am so joyful in Jehovah, my soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me in salvation. Dress me with a robe of triumph, like a bridegroom wearing a festive turban, or a bride adorned with her jewels. For just as the earth brings forth its plants, or a garden makes its plants spring up, so Jehovah our God will cause victory and glory to spring up before all nations. Chapter 62, for Zion's sake, I will not be silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out brightly, brightly and her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory. Then you will be called by a new name which Jehovah himself will pronounce. That's fascinating because we're going to be given a new name, right? The name that Yeshua will call us. We're going to have, well, the holy city of Jerusalem is going to get a new name. But they done messed up that one. So you get a fresh name. You, he talks about in terms of uh, Jerusalem, you will be glo you will be a glorious crown in the hand of Jehovah, a royal diadem held by your God. You will no longer be spoken of as a azuva or abandoned place, or your land be spoken of as a shamama or desolate place. Rather, you will be called. Hebzi va, my delight is in her. This is we getting into that uh, examples of beauty and splendor, which are spelled out also in Revelations. Then it goes on and say, and you and your land will be my beula, which means Mary or my bride. For Jehovah delights in you, and your land will be merry. As a young man marries a young woman, your sons will marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, your God will rejoice over you. So Jehovah is going to bring the people back. Let, let us all know that we are his children. We belong to him. And that is greater than all of the pain of exile and suffering that we brought upon ourselves by our disobedience. The disobedience of man 
has brought all these things to be. So the curses, as we said it in our lesson, come from disobedience. You initiate the curse when you are disobedient to the rules that Jehovah has told us that we should obey. And so he's still going to show us his love, which he's already done by sending Yeshua, our Messiah. But now as we're gathered up and we're ruling with him, Yeshua, then the pain of the past will be gone because the splendor of Yeshua, we will be filled with that and the zeal for the word and to do the things of Jehovah our God will be present in us and overflowing. He says then, and he uses this bond of marriage to express something like a, a first time marriage, right? A bride and a groom as they come together, all is well. Whatever has gone on is gone, it's the past. Now we're pressing forth to a future, our future based on our promise to one another and our promise to Jehovah to be obedient. And it will be like that. It will be a blessed event throughout our years if we stay obedient and humble to Jehovah, our God. So then he says in verse six, I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem, they will never fall silent, neither by day nor by night. You who call on Jehovah, give yourselves no rest. We don't need the sun and the moon because the light of Jehovah and Yeshua, our Messiah, will be so bright and we will be so filled with his glory. He will give no rest until, verse 7, until he restores Jerusalem and makes it a praise on the earth. Jehovah has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm, never again will I give your grain to your enemies as food, nor will strangers drink your wine, for which you work so hard to deal with. But those who harvest the grain will eat it with praises to Jehovah. So it's because of disobedience that contrary to this ever took place. Then he says, those who gather the wine will drink it in the courtyards of my sanctuary. Go on through, go on through the gates, clear the way for the people, build up a highway, build it up, clear away the stones, raise a banner for the people. Remember, <coughs> Jehovah is our banner. Then he goes on. He says, Jehovah has proclaimed to the end of the earth, verse 11, say to the daughter of Zion, here your salvation is coming. Here his reward is with him and his recompense is before him. This, these words and this imagery is also in Revelation. They will call them the holy people, the redeemed of Jehovah. You will be called Darusha or sought after. Ir lo neeza, city no longer abandoned. Then we get to chapter 63. Who is this coming from Edom, from Bozar, with clothing stained crimson? Crimson is red so magnificently dressed, so stately in his great strength. It is I who speak victoriously, I well able to save. So this is Yeshua, our Messiah. Why is your apparel red, he will be asked, your clothes like someone treading in a wine press? I have trodden the wine press alone. From the peoples, not one was with me. So I trod them in my anger, trampled them in my fury. So their lifeblood spurted out on my clothing. 
and I have stained all my garments. That great and terrible day. For the day of vengeance. Now that's the part that Yeshua did not say in when he gave the talk in the book of Luke and said the spirit of the sovereign God is upon me. He didn't bring this part in because he didn't come to do it then. But now we hear, he says, for I have stained all my garments, verse four, for the day of vengeance that was in my heart and my year of redemption have come. I looked, but there was no one to help. And I was appalled that no one upheld me. Therefore, my own arm brought me salvation. And my own fury upheld me. In my anger, I trod down the peoples, made them drunk with my fury, then poured out their lifeblood on the earth. I will recall the grace of Jehovah and the praises of Jehovah because of all that Jehovah has granted us and his great goodness towards the house or the people of Israel, which he bestowed on them in keeping with his mercy, in keeping with the greatness of his grace. For he said, they are indeed my people, children who are not disloyal. So he became their savior. Yeshua is our savior, Rebel even though the people killed him. There was a purpose in that. And he reconciled man back to Jehovah, our God. Then he goes on in verse nine, in all their troubles, he was troubled. Then the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and pity, he redeemed them. He had lifted them up and carried them throughout the days of old. So all leading up to this time, all leading up to the time of Yeshua's return, he is sovereign, he is governing everything, and he is watching over and keeping his word to perform it. So he's saying here that this is going to happen. This will happen. Revelation says, this will happen. And so therefore, we can take delight in this time, this present time that we're in. And as we go out, we can go out strong with the word of the scriptures. We can come home and teach our children and our children's children the scriptures. And then most and foremost, we stand. Having done all we can do, Paul says, stand on this word. Don't cow down. Stand on the word. Let the people see your stance and let them learn from what you teach. And so it goes on and we see that the Haftar, the Haftar ends with the understanding that Jehovah has chosen a people to be his example of his love for his creation. And so it ends in this final consolation with Yeshua our Messiah ruling on his throne in Jerusalem with an iron hand and we rejoice to see that day and be participants in what this prophet Isaiah saw the revelation was given to him by Jehovah our God, and he was able to tell the people that even though the temple will be destroyed, don't you lose your hope. Because your hope is the understanding that the Redeemer, your Savior, is coming. And with him, he brings blessings and great tidings from our Father. And so with that, we conclude the seven consolations that we've gone for seven weeks. We've gone to the building up of this climax 
which gets us right close to Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement, which it was when the high priest would go behind the curtain and sprinkle the blood when the temple was standing over the mercy seat, the seat of Yeshua, our Messiah. So with that, let's get into the Brit Hadasha, which is Romans chapter 9, verse 30 to chapter 10, verse 13. We're going to see in this passage of scripture that Paul is going to say many things that Moses said in Nitzavim. So that's what kind of tied, that's what this companion of this text is. And we're going to see some of the same text utilized from Deuteronomy by Paul or Shaul as he was teaching the people in Rome concerning standing. No matter what, stand. We'll find out as we get through that in chapter 10, we're going to see where these people were under duress because of their faith in Yeshua as Messiah. They had great affliction being brought their way, not only by the Roman government, but also Paul was continually bombarded by uh, Jewish leaders that basically said he was lying. Even putting a price on his head. And so we'll see then that Paul says the same thing. And, and many times we'll talk about law and grace. But what Paul points out is the very same thing that Moses points out. Because Moses gets the vision and tells these people that it is through his grace that he's going to bring you all back together, not because you're so good or anything other than he said he would. And it's his mercy and grace that is going to cause him to do that. To what? Confirm his word. So no, it wasn't that the Tanakh or the Old Testament was just legalism. No, it pointed out to us what we are supposed to do. And when you don't do it, it pointed out consequences for that. Now, Yeshua came to do what? Reconcile us back to the Father and then give us the Ruach HaKodesh. After he put us in right standing with the Father, then said, now don't mess up. But if you do, let it be a what? You missed the mark. You slipped up. But don't set out. Because setting out is intentional sin. Don't do that. Because I'm also going to give you the Ruach HaKodesh to empower you to obey. So Moses is closing out his life with the children of Israel and telling them there is no excuse. You know these words. You have seen what Jehovah has done. They had just had three big battles on the east side of the Jordan, in the land of Moab. And in all three battles, they didn't lose a man. So these were signs that Jehovah was with them. And he gives us signs today. Because what? Yeshua said, I'm with you until the end of the age. I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. However, we have to get into the understanding that even in grace, there's responsibility. Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments. <laughs> if you love me, keep my commandments. And then by doing that, demonstrating your what? Your trust and faith. This is what Moses told him. It is by faith and trust in Jehovah that you will get the good of the land. So he was saying the same thing Paul is saying. Why? Because Paul was using the Torah to explain to the Gentile believers and those Jewish converts how this understanding of this renewed covenant would work. And so Man then has a human responsibility. Yes, Jehovah is sovereign, 
and desire that all men will come to him and none perish. But men choose to be disobedient and ignore, as Moses said on Wednesday night in Nizamim, that you'll say that uh, you're okay, you're cool, you don't need, you don't need, it don't take all that. It don't take all that obedience. Just let the grace, I'm just going to stay with grace. I'm going to do what I want to do and expect grace to always prevail. So I can do what I want to do. But yet and still, grace will prevail. No, Jehovah did, Yeshua didn't say that. And Jehovah didn't say that through Moses. He said they're going to repent. And then he's going to take away your stony heart. Repentance comes, but you got to act on repentance. Let's go on with this lesson. Many times I get excited. So let's go on. <laughs> Romans chapter 9, verse 30, reading from the complete Jewish Bible translation. So what are we to say? This, that Gentiles, even though they were not striving for righteousness, have obtained righteousness but it is a righteousness grounded in what? Faith or trusting. So even though they didn't know all of the Torah and all these things at that time, these new believers under the tutelage of the apostles and the Ruach HaKodesh were gaining an understanding that surpassed the non-believing Jews in putting them in right standing with Jehovah, our God. And so, however, he says, Israel, even though they kept pursuing a Torah that offers righteousness, did not reach what the Torah offers. Why? Because they did not pursue righteousness as being grounded in trusting, but as if it were grounded in doing works. Thinking that they could work their way. If we just do these things, we'll be okay. They stumble over the stone that makes people stumble. As the Tanakh puts it of the Old Testament, look, I am laying in Zion a stone that will make people stumble, a rock that will trip them up. But he who rests his trust on it, rest his trust on that rock, Yeshua our Messiah, will not be humiliated. Chapter 10. Brothers, my heart's deepest desire and my prayer to God for Israel is for their salvation. So the, these non-believing Jews in Yeshua as the Messiah, these are the non-believers. They would come behind Paul and try to discredit everything he was doing. But his heart was still, and that's why we have to pray for everyone. We pray for the unsaved. We pray for the saved and the unsaved. He says, for I can testify to their zeal for God, but it is not based on correct understanding. For since they are unaware of God's way of making people righteous and instead seek to set up their own, they have not submitted themselves to God's way of making people righteous. Trust in Messiah. They haven't submitted to that, except for those that would be considered Messianic Jews or Jews that adhere to the principles of the Torah as we are supposed to be, because we've been grafted in, Paul says, to the same promises and covenants. Let's go on. For the goal of which the Torah aims is to point you to a Messiah who offers righteousness to everyone who trusts. For Moses writes about the righteousness grounded in the Torah, that the person who does these things will attain life through them. Moses said, today I'm offering you life or death. Choose life. Choose obedience. There's no difference. No difference in what Moses is saying and what Paul is saying. For moreover, the righteousness grounded in trusting says, or in faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, 
that is to bring the Messiah down, or who will descend into Shaul, that is to bring the Messiah up from the dead. What then does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. This is what Moses is saying in Deuteronomy chapter 30. He, would, he wrote this. Paul is quoting from what Moses said to the children of Israel in chapter 30. He says, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. No excuse. Don't say, I didn't understand that the Messiah has come. No excuse. You can't say, um, did he really go to and, 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 and come and rise? Did he really rise from the dead? We, you can't say that because the word is clear and has pointed these things out. Moses says, you're, no, you're not going to have any excuse. Either you're going to obey and be blessed or you're going to be disobedient and be cursed. Then he goes on to say, that is the word about trusting, which we proclaim, namely, that if you acknowledge publicly in your mouth that Yeshua is Lord and trust in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be delivered or you will be saved. For with the heart, Paul says, one goes on trusting, thus continuing towards righteousness, while with the mouth, one keeps on making public acknowledgement and thus continues towards deliverance or salvation. For the passage quoted says that everyone who rests his trust on him, meaning Messiah, will not be humiliated. That means that there is no difference between a Jew and a Gentile. Jehovah is the same for everyone, rich toward everyone who calls on his name, since everyone who calls on the name of Jehovah will be delivered. So this is the lesson that Paul is teaching to the church at Rome who are suffering under great persecution. But he's saying the same thing concerning grace and faith that Moses said. Moses says, if you trust this word I'm giving you, if you trust Jehovah to do everything he said he's going to do, why would you be disobedient? Paul is saying the very same thing. If you trust in what Yeshua did, if you trust on what he said, if you trust on the call he has placed on your life and his ability to bring it to pass, if you trust in these things, you will fulfill the plan and the purpose for which you were created. He goes on to say that when we think about law or rules, understand this, that those who refuse to listen don't want any rules and laws. We can see that going on today. People don't want to obey anything. If the science says COVID can best be dealt with this way, people said, I don't care what the science says. I want it done my way. Why can't I have it my way? They want to be their own God. So Paul is pointing out here that the law came which he's going to talk about being a schoolmaster to teach us what's right and what's wrong. And the Ruach HaKodesh helps us act through righteous acts. And so this is what Paul is saying. This is what he's talking about here. He's just connecting it to what Moses was saying. There's no difference. This is what the law had a purpose. And what was the purpose of the law? He said to point you to the Messiah. In other words, to point you to the need of a savior. Why? Because you couldn't do it. You could not obey it. Moses told him, you're gonna, if you're going to be disobedient and you're going to do all these things, this is what's going to happen. I've already seen Ye Jehovah has given me a vision of your disobedience. So even in the prophet Isaiah, 
who prophesied to the northern kingdom that if you don't repent and turn from your evil ways and connect yourself back to Jehovah, your God, then you're going into captivity. Then they went into captivity. After that, Isaiah prophesied to the southern kingdom where the temple was standing and told them, don't do what your brothers did. You saw what they did. You saw them go into captivity. Don't do what they did. Yet, they did what they did. And the temple was destroyed. The Babylonians came through and tore up everything and took the people into captivity. So the purpose of the law was to teach us the need, what's right and what's wrong, and show us our inability to do it. Then point us toward what? A savior. We read that in the text of Isaiah. I'm gonna be your redeemer. I'm gonna be your savior. I'm gonna do these things for you. So we see the companion study. Paul is saying the same thing. He's saying, look, there's no difference in what you saw happen to the children of Israel. As you study this word, you'll find out what happened to them. He says, but it's by faith in Yeshua to get you through to do all he would have you to do. It takes faith in Yeshua to do that. He says, from the mouth, you speak. The mouth is the outward man, the intellectual, the, the understand. In other words, what's in you is what's going to come out through your mouth. The heart is the inner man. It's the will and the intellect. So the mouth demonstrates what you say. But your actions have to follow what you say. And when that happens, then from that basis, you are what? That's what this journey of salvation is all about. The journey of is what? He said, I'm going to cut those stony places of your heart out and put in you a new fleshly heart that will listen to me and do everything I want you to do. Just going to trust me. I'll, hey, I'm with you always to the end of this, your time. I'll be with you. But you got to trust me and do what I say. It takes more than it. Verbal acknowledgement. It takes a repentant heart and turning from your ways and humble yourself up under the word, the scriptures. The foundation of all scriptures is the Torah, the first five books. Humble yourself up under that. And you will do what? Just like Moses says, blessings will follow. You, the greatest blessing you can have is the understanding of Yeshua as Messiah, the Ruach HaKodesh coming to empower us to do all he would have us to do, and then actually doing it and having him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So it's more than just an acknowledgement. It is a change of heart, and that change must be visible through your actions. And then you're on the road. You were set apart for this. Now do what Jehovah, our God, has created you to do. All right. So that's the end of our lesson at this time. We're going to say shalom. Thank you so much for joining me. And I'm going to post this. It'll be on our YouTube page so that you can go back and review it. And those who may not have listened, uh, you can let them know that they can go to the YouTube page under uh, Predestined and Messiah Ministries, uh, Pastor Wusu Hodari, and you can see this lesson. Thank you so much for joining us. Let us pray. Jehovah, our God, we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for opening up our hearts and our minds to receive your word. 
We thank you for the Ruach HaKodesh that empowers us to be obedient. We thank you for Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, Savior, Redeemer, and soon coming King. We thank you for all in his mighty and majestic name. Amen and amen. Shalom, everyone. See you for Wednesday night Bible study, lesson number 52 of 52 lessons in Through the Torah in one year. Shalom.